I am a strategic intervention life coach and I've been a yoga instructor for about 30 years. I provide massive transformational value for women and men who are ready to break through limiting beliefs, to stop playing small. This is for those who want to see real changes physically, mentally, professionally, and in their relationships. Hello everyone, this is Giselle Toner and welcome to Ignite Your Value. This is the show that is going to take you from broken to brilliant from getting the love that you deserve to getting paid with your worth and everything in between. And today I have a really great guest that I'm excited to bring on and his name is John Muller. And John has an amazing story to tell. John has gone through a lot of trials and tribulations in life, but most importantly, he became a Buddhist monk, which he has a lot to tell us about. And now he's a spiritual teacher. He is a drug and, uh, drug and alcohol counselor, and he is a meditation teacher. And he has a lot of amazing things to his credit. But I want to introduce John because I want John to tell us his story, which is really kind of fascinating. So, John, welcome to the show. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. It's nice to be here. Good. So, John, let's just really jump into the main thing right now that I really want to talk to you about. And I know that in order for you to go into becoming a Buddhist monk, there had to be something that really compelled you to do that. So yeah. what yeah. was it? What happened? Okay, yeah, I think it was a combination. First of all, thank you so much for letting me be here. And just uh, I want to say hi to everyone who's watching and tuning in. So yeah, uh, when I was 25 years old, I went into a Buddhist center and I moved in at a Buddhist retreat center in the middle of the woods in upstate New York. And the, the thing that made me want to do that was I was going through an extremely rough time before that, like mentally. I was working as a drug and alcohol counselor, and I just had a lot of stress in my life. And to be honest, I felt like life felt meaningless. And I, I, I did feel like there's got to be something more to life than this. But if you go back even further, I was, there was a really tough breakup that I went through, and I had a lot of guilt. Uh, the girl really, like... She was my best friend for a few years and then she like started hating me <laughs> and like I didn't know who I was. I had been looking at myself from her point of view and she really adored me for a while and saw the best in me. And so I saw the best in myself and then I, I lost that. And not only that, she started to like despise me. Right. And um, so I didn't I didn't have I didn't even know who I was. I didn't have that exalted view of myself. I didn't know who I was. I was trying my best, but I was not happy. Uh, in fact, at work one day, my coworker teased me a little bit, and I like, I basically like started crying, and I had I had to like leave the room. I had like a mini, you know, breakdown. I suppose you'd call it, but it was basically like this pressure had built up, and a little tap made it crack, and I I started to become aware that I'm not uh, in a good place. I was trying to help my clients, but I could only help those who were less happy than me. Right. And some of them weren't less happy than me. <laughs> there, well, I remember one that, person, that's a, that's a great way to look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like there was one person in particular, like, I think that this is something that happens to counselors a lot. And maybe it was just me, but like, you're not that happy, you know, you want to help. And if someone's doing well, you try to like pull them down so you can help them. Wow. And like, I noticed that my mind was like wanting to do that in that one case, like, I should probably create a problem so that I can solve it for him. Wow. You know? And wow. it was, it was not a, uh, you know, a good place. And then by uh, basically uh, what happened was to my credit, I didn't fill my life with meaningless crap at that point. Like I knew my, um, I wasn't doing that much. I wasn't like I had drifted away from old friends who were not good for me. I didn't have, any real great direction but I didn't just fill my free time I was like lonely I was bored I was not doing that much but I I didn't fill my time with with meaningless stuff with addictions I just I just kind of stayed in neutral and and in a sense worked through the pain right I kind of accepted it and worked through it and then um, someone told me about a Buddhist temple nearby and I was like oh that sounds great and I had previously developed an interest in Buddhism that was kind of like on the side 
burner that I wasn't really doing much with. And so I went to the temple and it just like clicked and I just loved it. And I basically never left once I went there. But the thing was, a lot of people go there and a lot of people don't stick to it in the way I did. So why did I take to it so strongly? I think it was because I had so much room in my life. I didn't fill my life with stuff that didn't matter to me. I, I wasn't doing that much that mattered at one point, but I wasn't doing a lot that didn't matter. And so when I found this amazing place, this amazing source of, of happiness and goodness and you know uh, this community, I had the space to just kind of hit the ground running. And that's why I was able to, to move in right away, to live there for five years, to become a monk, to join all the teaching programs, to do retreats. Like I've did more retreats in those five years than most people will ever do in their whole life. Wow. You know? And <clears throat> I have a question though. Sure. And I want you to, you know, cause I've always thought in my mind and I always had this question and I never really knew the answer. Um, as a Buddhist monk, are you allowed to have relationships with women or are you forbidden? Kind of like the Catholic priests are not allowed to have relationships. That's a good question. So yes, as a monk, monks, I'm not a monk anymore, mm -hmm. but monks and nuns in Buddhism are not uh, allowed to have, uh, it's, it's a celibate path. Okay. The, that's the main, um, th that's the uh, principle is celibacy, right? There's obviously many pieces to being, ordained is not just celibacy but that's one piece and that includes yeah like if you have a relationship you can't have a relationship but because probably if you did you'd end up having sex <laughs> right right, right. <laughs> right and that's not that's forbidden okay i never knew the story with that i always knew that monks you know normally i don't you never see them with anybody so i kind of figured that that was the that was the way it is how did you feel about that were you totally okay with it with yeah it's a great question in the beginning i was totally okay with it <laughs> 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 so i was 28 i was 28 when i became a monk that's kind of young right and yeah. i was kind of a late bloomer as well and so i was like really just coming into like the prime of, of my life in some ways so um yeah, I was 28. At first, I was so like behind all the principles that I didn't that didn't bother me. I was like, oh yeah, no problem. I'm just gonna make spiritual progress, and I won't even have any attachment left within a couple of years, and I'll be good. I'll be good. Yeah. But I thought I thought that was gonna happen, and for the first year of being ordained, I was pretty fine. I was like, my nose was in the on the path. I was not really getting much distracted, but about a year in, I had a noticeable shift in, the, in my energy. And basically, I think what happened was I had been repressing attachment. I like this desire, sexual desire. So I've been repressing it and I didn't know. And, and then I started to, it started to become very apparent after my first year of being ordained, where like basically these women would come visit the temple and do a working visit maybe, or it'd stay for like a week and then leave, or they'd come from all different countries to volunteer or even just come on retreat or something. And I would um, notice my mind was <laughs> very interested. In the, in the oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. So you noticed about a year into it that, hey, you know what? I'm kind of missing something here, right? It was, yeah, it was very strong. It was very strong. So and what happened? What ha yeah, what, what was the results? Because <laughs> you stayed in another four years after that. Yeah. So um, the result was that uh, for a while, I was able to just kind of work through it. And I was repressing less, which was good. And, but also I was, uh, I was noticing it and I had to work through it. And so it made it, it made it challenging. It may, basically, what happened was I, I was presented with a choice each time, you know, a beautiful woman would come from some place where she's like a supermodel, and then she just comes on a working visit. I'm just like, and we're like in the middle of the woods, just, you know, so like it's a little bit isolated. And uh, if depending on my mind and how my practice was going, if my practice was going great, I was I was fine. But if I if it wasn't, I was like, I need happiness somewhere. 
it's not coming from a practice. Oh, there's there's some happiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she's actually really cute. <laughs> oh yeah. So, <gasps> but uh, my friend and I had a joke that there's a supermodel bus that would come and drop women off every week from the city or something and pick them back up. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, so what happened was, yeah, anyway, keep going. No, I was going to say, so what happened? Um, at one point, I, there, I did meet someone who I was interested in. And we had a very innocent thing where we held hands and we kissed. While you were a monk? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Behind the scenes, I'm sure nobody was watching. Anyone, no, I didn't tell anyone that. Okay. I mean, I told one or two people that, but yeah, um, it was it was quite innocent, and we only saw each other maybe three, four times. Uh, she lived in New York City, um, but it it kind of put uh, it gave me the choice. It put the choice in a really clear perspective. Like I could go and do this. Like she was open to it. She was gorgeous. I was like, she was like a, she was a legit model and actress. Wow. You know, from Colombia, wow. Mexico. Like, and I was like, oh, this is uh, just what I always wanted, right? And so, uh, <laughs> I had the choice to go do yeah. it. God answered my prayers. It right? was like that. It was like that. And like, to my defense, I was in a really good mental place. And so I would have been a good, you know, partner for somebody at that time. I think, but uh, <laughs> I, I decided not to. I decided not to do it. And, you know, we never did anything sexual, really. Um, our clothes always stayed on. And um, it was very innocent, but it gave me the choice. And I decided to stick with ordination. And she understood. But uh, that was, that was in a sense, that was the beginning of, of the, the end of it. Because... Once I did that, I did. It, I knew I could do it again. Right. So I did right. It again, I did it again, and it kept going a little bit further and further. Right. And basically, um, at some point, I did let that stuff go, and I, then I went on my own personal solitary retreat. I moved to Florida, and I um, I joined a center there, and I became a, a teacher, a resident teacher. And so I, I stopped doing anything like that and I just kept myself uh, pure, you know, and the whole time I was practicing, but it was, it was just this battle with repression, with repressing this, in a sense, this natural urge to procreate, to have intimacy, yeah. right? Yeah. It, was, it is a natural urge and I, I had been repressing it for a while. I had been yeah. not facing it. And then when I started to face it, it became difficult to control because I had no ability I had no practice controlling it all I'd ever done was push it away right. so it took it took some practice to learn to be in that kind of situation and exhibit control at the same time right. and I was uh, with it without pushing it away but what you know welcome it and still do the right thing right so it took yeah it took me some practice to do that and um, yeah, eventually, though, I decided to, to just to go in that direction mm -hmm. and to, uh, to, that I really wanted an intimate relationship. Right, right. So it's of, very difficult. I, I mean, honestly, it's so difficult for me to wrap my head around anything that would require a man or a woman to totally stop, like, something that is so basic and so necessary you know because let's face it um even if you've if you've ever read the book think and grow rich you know there's a whole chapter on sex and sexual energy and sexual, how energy, sexual sex, energy sexual energy sexual energy can be used for other purposes that's <laughs> true that's true exactly but but the actual feelings that go along with it it's very difficult for most people to separate it. But this is the thing. You can have a sexual relationship with someone, but also direct that energy also in a really good way. Because a lot of people have sexual experiences with people and it's terrible and they're using it in a totally wrong way and it's destructive. But there's a constructive way to do it where you actually are engaging and you're with someone, but it's 
but it's a soul bond. It's a soul bond. It's a spiritual bond. It's not just, let me go out there and get my rocks off. You know, it's so deep. Right. And, yes. and that's I would really say that's more rare. That's pretty rare. And it, it requires you to be, to have a sort of a higher level of, of mental development, I think, to be able exactly. to, to approach it that way. And yeah. for a lot of people, you, you can't just turn that on. You can't be like, Oh, well, I really want to go and have sex. So let me get my mind in a really good place so that it's not going to work that way. It has to be real. You know, it comes from deep work, you know? Exactly. And, yeah, I mean, you mentioned a couple of really good points, which is one, sexual energy is very powerful mm -hmm. and that we, we do need to sort of transmute it and use it in other ways. And that is the purpose behind celibacy, actually. Okay. When you're celibate, you kind of, it's like you, um, in a sense, you put a cork in it, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, and your energy stays in. Your yeah. energy stays in, and then you you find yourself feeling blissful. Your mind is very lucid. You can yeah. focus really powerfully. That's yeah. the purpose. So you can make a lot of spiritual progress, uh, or even people do it for work. I mean, right. there's some people while well, they're still working on a creative project for business, they don't have sex right. because it lets it out, right? It lets it's out. It's, it ruins the creative process. Even athletes, yes, absolutely. Athletes, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, being able to withhold our, you know, keep inside our sexual energy is very important. And it, when you want to do this, it helps to understand what you said, which is that sex is not going to make you happy. There are many people who are very unhappy with, with sex. Even when they willingly have sex with someone, it can be a bad experience. And at least a very ordinary, normal experience, right? And so there's certainly, you know, you can see that in the world, many people are having sex, and those same people, in many cases, are not that happy. So no, they're that, actually miserable. <laughs> miserable. So that proves that sex does not lead to happiness, right? right? And some okay. people have less sex, and they're and they're more happy. Right. And right. and as you said, you know, it takes a lot of training and spiritual connection to be able to really know how to use it the right way. And a lot of people just don't know, they don't have mm -hmm. that direction, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I'll give an analogy for that. It's kind of like um, when you're over, trying to overcome anger. So the whole thing is like overcoming our negative emotions. If you can have sex without this, this, this desirous attachment, this sticky desire, this unrealistic expectations, then you'll be able to to have a very intimate connected bonding experience with someone but if you so you have to leave out that sticky desire and in the case that i'll give an analogy that's easier to understand with anger you want to leave anger out of your relationships right of course that makes sense mm -hmm. and let's just say you have a confrontation at work or something or confrontation with the person sometimes we have to leave the situation to get our mind in the right place and then maybe we can come back with a clear mind and then address the situation and make it, make it right. There's, with training, we can, in the moment, prevent anger and stay engaged in the situation and make it right and be kind in the moment. But a lot of times for most people, they have to take themselves away from the situation, get their mind clear, remove the anger, then they can come back. And it's the same thing what you're saying with, with sex. It's helpful sometimes to take some time off from it, do the work, get your mind in a really good place, then come back, and now you're ready to actually engage in that action without, and you won't be bringing uh, as many uh, negative states of mind into it. Yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking, you know, what you just said. It really does help to remove yourself for a while and really get the right kind of spiritual um, fortitude, I, I'm going to call it, or whatever it is, just to be able to really go back into it again with the right intention in the right way so that it is something really productive and beautiful rather than something that's going to drag you down because so many people have sex addictions and yeah. it's horrible. You know, they, they don't know what to do because they have this horrible urge to do something. It's, it, and it is a horrible urge sometimes because they fight it. They're fighting it and fighting it. They don't know how to express it properly. You know? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find that in myself, it can look like I want sex, but sometimes it's just like very simple. I want intimacy. I want, I want a kind exchange with someone. 
you know, I want a good feeling. So like, there's lots of ways to get that stuff that isn't sex. Yeah, exactly. And that is so true. But most people just think it's a sexual act and I've got to do it and I've got to do it to release and feel better. But yes, that's part of it. But what's leading up to it is really the key. And what's leading up to it is basically your connection to something much greater than yourself. You know, you're channeling something that's amazing and it's not just a biological release. It really is the life force. And that is part of what we are, you know? Yes, yeah, it's the life force. And we should honor our life. We should preserve, we should take care of our life. We should understand that it's precious yeah. and we shouldn't just go using it for, for um, inferior purposes, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. So how are you feeling today with all of your training and all of your knowledge and everything that you've got? Where are you now? Well, I feel really great. Um, what, the last couple of years, so I'm not a monk anymore. And uh, my last year of being a monk, I was kind of separating from my community anyway. So I was the kind of in between. But um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been rough, you know, especially the beginning of this year. I, officially, I'm not a monk anymore starting in January of, of this year, 2019. And uh, it's, it's been really hard. But when did you actually stop? It was very early January this year. January, okay. And um, yeah, it was, um, it's extremely challenging. Uh, I was, I didn't, it's like losing my identity in a sense. Again, it was losing my identity. It was not having a spiritual community to, uh, to connect with. I had been, um, in a sense, dependent on my spiritual community for, for being able to practice, you know, for being able to, you know, volunteering with them was really a helpful source of energy for me. Right. Plugging in and, and receiving teachings is like so much easier when you do it in a group. Right. And I just didn't have that stuff. And also I was, I was a teacher. I was looked to as a, um, as a guide. And even when I wasn't a teacher, I was still taking that role many times of, of helping other people and having, having less people to, to view me that way, to ask for help, to, uh, to see something, you know, wonderful in me, that, that was hard too. Because when someone sees something amazing in you, it helps to bring it out, right? right? And my community was always helping to bring out the best parts of me. And also, I like, I needed, I needed so I needed to feel useful. I needed to feel like my life was meaningful. And I like, I didn't have anyone I didn't have very many people to talk to in any kind of meaningful way. And I would forget, you know, that, that I have something special inside sometimes. You so, know, everyone, every one of us has to feel significant. That's just part of our, you know, quest in life. We've got to feel significant. Yeah. And the key, I believe the answer to that is be, being of service to others. And I'll tell you that one of the turnarounds for me, it might sound really, really silly, but a friend told me, like your life is really interesting you should start a youtube channel and so i started this youtube channel and it was called from woke to whack to woke and oh my God. <laughs> i share my journey of like lots of spiritual progress on this mountain falling down and now i'm not a monk anymore and then how do i build it back up right yeah. and um i thought it was an interesting premise i didn't really publish many episodes of it but i filmed a bunch and uh, it really, it really helped me to, when I just started talking to the camera, sharing what I was doing to, uh, to make my life good, what my struggles were, all that kind of stuff, it made me feel really useful. Yeah. Even you know, you normal. have to, you've got to, you've got to put that out there. You absolutely do. And I also know that right now you are very very useful people are starting to look to you so much more now because of what you can contribute because of your talents and you've got talents so right now you are in the middle of forming an amazing community with people that are looking up to you That's tell true. me about that oh okay well yeah we're doing a really cool project and the, I, I think the best part about this project is it's extremely selfless on my part there's no mm -hmm. self-interest for yeah. me, which is making, which is why it's so easy to make it happen. It's, it's come so far in such a short period of time. So the project is 
uh, is for wellness uh, providers, wellness experts who want to have a business, who, who want to get more clients for their wellness business. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing marketing for people individually, which is something I was uh, playing around with and doing Facebook ads and sales videos and stuff, it's, instead of that, we're just, we're all co-authoring an ebook together and we're creating a video membership site together. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're going to be able to, to kind of pull clients off from there. You know, yeah. I, you know, I have to tell you something, John, what you're doing is really, really important and very amazing because number one, what you were doing before is great, but honestly, you were just putting yourself in a position where you were trading, you know, maybe dollars for hours and there's not enough time in the day, but when you do what you're doing, which is what most really smart entrepreneurs are doing now, you know, is you are number one helping the masses. You're helping huge amounts of people, which makes it number one so much better for them, but so much better for you because you're helping more people with your gift that you've got. And you've got a talent, you've got a gift because of number one, you know, from your own sources of spirituality and coming into this with, the, with a really good heart and the way to do it properly. That's number one. The second thing is you're reaching a lot of people and more and more people that hear about it, know about it, are going to want to be a part of it. If they're in that sphere of being an entrepreneur, if you're a spiritual person, um, you know, if you've got something really good to give to the planet, this is not for people, correct me if I'm wrong. This is not for people who are destructive and doing things that aren't good. It's for people that want to go out into the world and really make a huge difference because right. the world needs it. Right. Of course. Yeah. And I just happen to be able to attract the kind of the right kind of people and yeah. to notice talent, like through my own spiritual practice, my, my, all my wellness practices and stuff, I can really see when people are doing that too. And that's how I, of course I noticed you and how great you are. Oh, you were one of the very first people I asked to be on this project. Yes, I know. I know. I'm excited. And I yeah. want you to, Maybe give us a little sample right now of like a way to bring our awareness to a focused place where we can really start to feel our own greatness or just like maybe a minute of kind of like a, a connectivity that you sure, do really like well. Med meditation or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, there's a really great meditation that I could guide and I'll just make it into a one minute practice and if you have more time, just do it for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Is that is now a good time to start? Right now, absolutely. Okay. For one minute, I want to really feel my zen. One minute, okay. Yeah. So find a comfortable position. Close your eyes and just relax. We can start to notice our breathing. Whatever's on your mind and anything else that you'd like to let go of in your life, just breathe it away and imagine that you let it go. Breathe out everything that you want to be free of in your life. Imagine that it's gone forever. And we can breathe in everything we wish to have in our life everything we wish to be, breathe it in. Imagine that now you have and you are all these things. Feel what it feels like to let go of everything you wish to be free of in your life. Feel what it's like to embody all the great qualities that you want to have. Make a decision to keep this state of mind with you during the day. Always keep it present, never let it go.
And when we're ready, we can begin to relax our concentration and arise from meditation with this beautiful experience in our heart. Oh, well, I'll tell you, just for one minute, it's amazing what one minute yeah. of focusing on your breath and your awareness of how powerful we really are as beings and listening to a guided meditation. Um, it actually is so wonderful because it really does bring you to that place. I can feel surges of energy just right now in my body, just from that. And that was wonderful. So John, um, do you have a website in case anybody wants to find you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I have an 11 day challenge, 11 day spiritual challenge mm -hmm. that people can sign up for. It's uh, 11 spiritual steps.com with the number uh, one, one spiritual steps.com. Okay. Uh, www one, one spiritual steps.com. It's an 11 day challenge. You can sign up for it and take the challenge. It's really great. I've had such great feedback from this challenge. And uh, basically, you get lifetime access to it when you sign up. And that's so. really easy. It's very easy to remember. 1111daychallenge.com. Oh, no. 11spiritualsteps.com. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Did I say it wrong? No, no. I probably got it wrong. So it's 111spiritualsteps.com. That's right. Because it only. It only takes 11 days to get into the spiritual groove. I love so it. That's we all get into the spiritual groove together. I guide you in. And once you're in the spiritual groove, it's just so easy to stay there. Yeah. It's just getting inside. That's exactly. what most people don't want to put in the work to do that. So we do it together. I walk you through. And now we're in. And I love it. You do it uh, to stay there for your life. So I love it. Yeah. Well, I, I am excited because I really feel like we got so much out of this. And it was really interesting to hear about your whole thing and, and i know there's a lot more unfortunately we don't have time but honestly i am so um much more enlightened about the whole thing and even though you went through it it was a beautiful thing and it was really important for you and now you are serving in a whole different way because of the fact that you went through so many different things and you can give so much more to people so thank you so much john for being a part of this thank interview you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to interview you now, if you will. One of these days you will. We'll set okay. that up. I've okay, got cool. some stories. You want to hear some yeah. stories? Woo! <laughs> I've got some stories to tell you. But anyway, all right. Well, everyone, I am going to conclude this interview. It was really great to have John on today. And um, remember, check back again because... This show is called Ignite Your Value, and I do a lot of interviews with people, and I also do my own trainings. So come, come on back again. Make sure that you tune in uh, for a lot more in the future. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting now. So, John, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, yeah. everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay. So uh, this is John Muller here. I'm here with special guest Giselle. And I want to introduce her. So myself, uh, maybe you know, I was a spiritual, um, I am a spiritual coach. I was a Buddhist monk for many years. Um, I have a degree in psychology. I was a counselor for many years as well. So my background is like wellness. I really love helping people. And uh, I'm here today because I want to show off one of the coolest people I know, Giselle. And she, uh, she's a, a life coach as well. I'll let her tell you what she does. But basically, she's a really cool person, and I love to introduce you, the best people that I know. So, Giselle, can you tell us like who you are, what you do, and that kind of stuff? John, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful introduction. I don't know if I deserve that, but I'm taking it. Thank you. <laughs> thank You're you welcome. so much. You're um, yeah, well, a little bit about me. I am a yoga teacher. I've been a yoga teacher for a very, very long time, for decades. And um, I was a life coach. I became a life coach about 15 years ago. And what I do basically is I combine the best of both of those modalities. So I coach women and I coach men also, but um, I have a lot of women and a lot of women come to me with a lot of issues where they're starting to feel very disempowered in their lives. Sometimes they go through life, they go through their lives serving everyone else and all of a sudden they wake up one day and they're very depleted. So what I do is I take them through um, 
program which combines and integrates the body and the mind and the spirit. So it's mm-hmm. a physical and a mental and a spiritual connection that I start to get them um, in touch with because a lot of times they lost it. And that's basically what I do. And, uh, and I also include my horse because I have a horse and I do equine wisdom coaching. So I take my clients occasionally with me to the stable and I take them through a series of really wonderful processes where they start to learn so much more about themselves just through the power of the horse. Amazing. Wow. So I want to talk more about the horse at some point because I'm really uh, interested and curious about that. But can we just go back to uh, what you said about, um, you know, helping women who are spending their life kind of giving and putting their energy outside themselves and feeling depleted. And I think that, could you just speak to that, to that problem a little bit? Because I feel like it's really common and a lot of people listening are probably going to relate a lot. I know as a man, I don't quite relate as much. So can you just explain what that means? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of this stems from my own background, John. So the reason why I do what I do is because of what I experienced in my own life. And I know that a lot of women experience the same thing. So um, as a child, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, you know, I mean, I love my mother, my father, my siblings and all, but to say that it was um, normal would be quite a stretch. <laughs> it wasn't normal. But um, as a child, I experienced a lot of abuse, a lot of physical abuse, mental, emotional, and it was in the home. And then because that felt so familiar to me, I accepted it outside of the home. So basically what that means is I went from the frying pan to the fire. And I went from a really terrible, dysfunctional family life And it felt so familiar to be beaten up and it felt so familiar to be criticized and it felt so familiar to be hated that when I left my house at an early age, um, I went right into the same thing with people that was, that were in my life. So I accepted abuse there also. The abuses that I suffered after I left my house were even worse than when I was at home because um, it landed me in the hospital quite a few times with, um, you know, severe, severe abuse in every sense of the word. Now, this is really a tale of happiness, okay? Um, I don't tell everybody this because I want them to feel sorry for me. As a matter of fact, when I talk about it, I talk about it with a lot of joy because it changed my life because it allowed me to look at what was really wrong and examine it and find what I needed to do to climb out of that wreckage. And I found what I needed to do. And it was so spectacular and it was so wonderful. The more I started to realize the truth of everything, I knew that I was onto something really, really great. And I knew that I could help other people. But I didn't get to that place right away. It took me years and years and years of suffering and then a lot of studying and a lot of soul searching. And um, eventually I just got to the place where I am right now, which is a beautiful place. Wow. No, I can attest that you seem to be in quite a beautiful place. I mean, you can kind of tell, like, you know, the the fruits of somebody's practice, they're going to wear it. People wear the fruits of their own practice. And, you know, you you clearly have a presence. For me, that's very peaceful, loving, and happy, and confident, and strong. So it's it's clearly working, whatever you're doing. So I just think, um, yeah, like what you said about just being used to uh, the, the pain, the suffering, the trauma, and being treated a certain way. And you said that you were willing to accept that when you went out and that it became worse. And I think that um, it's not just accept, but that people sort of expect it, or it's like a sign of love, right? It's a sign of love. It like It's created this sort of like, call it like an empty puzzle piece inside us. And like someone has the right piece, like, if I get beaten in my childhood and then I d- stop, I, have, I might feel like people who love me beat me or people who I need so much in my life beat me. And you find someone else and as soon as they do it, like, oh, yes, good. I connect. We, can, we got each other here. So that must be a really interesting process to reverse, right? Because that I can, can go on for a lifetime. I can tell that you 
have done much studying in this regard because not everybody can really identify that aspect and that is exactly what it is. It's almost like you almost, and unfortunately it's, this is really sad and it's not almost, it is real. You mistake abuse for love and you start to feel the abuse of process and feel like somebody loves me so much. Like in other words, when I was beaten up, you know, by a mate, um, I would say he must, he must love me so much because he's so jealous of me that he, he's, he's outraged because he's so jealous because he loves me so much. And that's why he's beating me up sick. But that is what you think as an abused woman, right? Yeah. That's the classic abuse. Yeah. It's the classic abuse syndrome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a clear misunderstanding. I mean, now people tell me what you think. I think that people have various different natures and some of them are higher nature, some of them are lower, more like the animal instinct kind of stuff. And that seems like an animal kind of a thing, right? Like someone is claiming territory over me a little bit. Someone wants to possess me as their property. That must mean that, you know, that they care about me. It's a very, I would say a low vibe uh, relationship <laughs> well actually you know it's definitely not from the animal kingdom because animals don't act that way animals are so completely different in fact there's so much more evolved than we are in that area um, but what I would say it is more than anything else it's kind of like a dance you've got to have the willing participant and the perpetrator and the participant really looks for the perpetrator. It, you know, somebody, like when I was going through that, I would actually look for the sickest type of person because I wanted to heal them. And I would go for the person that was abusive because I would think, here's my opportunity to right the wrong. I can take mommy and daddy who really weren't nice to me and I could see that in this person, and this is my opportunity to love them so much that they're going to change for me, and I can right the wrong that was done to me years ago. Okay? Make sense? It does. It's crazy. but It, it is crazy. It's crazy that I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like, now tell me what you think. I think it's like a little bit like a badge of honor, too. Like, like look how patient and, um, I don't know if the word submissive is the best word, but like, yeah. patient like how womanly feminine i am like i can take all this like man like i'm like look at how bad he is i'm i'm i'm, I'm really special right that's is right there, is there like an ego thing involved oh there certainly is oh my god yeah you know it's funny because a lot of women will actually think that because she's putting up with the abuse that it's a sign that he loves me because he's still with me and that's how special i am you know, I'm so special. He's still with me, you know, and I'm the only one that could put up with this. So I'm the one, I'm the woman. Boy, I'll tell you, thinking oh, about that, God. it's terrible. And okay. it's sad, but it's really sad, John, because this is what a lot of women are going through. And then not only is it in the relationship department, but it, it actually um, goes into other areas of their lives also, where they're doing the same thing with their children with their jobs, they're accepting abuse, they're accepting the low end of things because they don't think that they deserve anything better than that. And that's when they come to me and that's where I get these women that are broken and they are at the bottom and they don't know where to go and they don't know how to change it around. And that's when I start doing what I do with them. It's amazing. And yeah. I they all find you. I know. I hope Everybody so finds you. All the women in various stages of their own development, I hope they find you because you're great. Oh, thanks. I want to ask you about what turned it around for you. So you mentioned that you started practicing various things to, yes. that were like physical, mental, spiritual. Yes. But like, can you elaborate a little bit on what, what were some of the mindset tweaks and what were some of the practices and energetic shifts and whatever that, that changed your situation? Okay. So I will start off with the fact that Horses had a lot to do with it. Horses. Oh, horses. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now I was also into yoga at a very young age. Don't ask me how or why I was so drawn to yoga, but I actually was really drawn to it at a really young age. I'm going to say around 10. And all I remember is the first time that I went into yoga, I was 
drawn to it by a book that I saw. I went into the library because I was always in the library as a kid. I was lonely. I was in the pet shops and in the libraries. That's all I did. <laughs> I swear. I was looking for love. I was looking for connection. And books did it for me and pets did it for me. So I was either in the pet store looking for a hamster or a snake or a toad or anything I could grab and love. Um, or I was in the library. So anyway, I went to the library and I pulled this book out. And the book was fascinating because it had pictures of these people doing these beautiful things with their bodies, you know, doing these really amazing things that I couldn't imagine how a human body could do this. So I was drawn to it and I started to read it and it was a yoga book. And from there I started to read, but this is the amazing part, John. When I got to the part about meditation and how to meditate, I read it and I was really, really astounded because what it told me to do, how to meditate, how to get silent and focus on one thing and just bring your awareness to one thing. I was already doing that on my own as a mm -hmm. child. It was a way that I would escape the reality of the abuse that I was going through. And I would just go in my room, shut the door and just focus on a word, one word. And I was doing this on my own without ever knowing anything about yoga or meditation. So when I read it in the book, I was really amazed. Um, anyway, needless to say, I started reading about yoga, practicing some of the poses, you know, to the best of my ability. And then through the years, I just started working more and more and more. There were no teachers around at that point, but I just became very immersed in yoga on my own. The other part was horses. There was a stable that was not that close to my house, but it was within walking distance. And I would walk to the stable every moment, every minute that I could, I would go to the stable, you know. And the horses were such a connection for me. They didn't judge me. They were beautiful animals. And I really felt like a very strong bond with the horses. And that never left me. So that's the reason why I am working with horses today. Mm -hmm. And if you do any research with horses, on horses there's so much therapy that is done today with people with horses and it really changes someone totally wow. yeah that's so interesting mm -hmm. i mean well i mean human beings have a very long history with horses right as being companions and mates and kind of you know it's like the dog but you know they were even more functional for human beings for a long time Yes, and we, we we relied on horses in a big, big way for a long time. So I'm not sure exactly what that means, but there's obviously some karmic connection there. I wonder, like, what is it? Just their energy, or is there are there specific mental shifts that happen? Like, what do you think it is? Okay, I know, I know what it is um, in a big way. First of all, horses are prey animals, so that means that they have had to run for their lives in order mm -hmm. to survive. Horses are not the ones that are aggressing or aggressive towards something else. They are, they are encroached upon and they're eaten by other animals. So they like have had to, a tiger, oh, you... wolves, wolves, bears, uh, not bears. I'm sorry. Wolves. Um, you know, the, a lot of the big cats, um, any the hyenas, you know, there are so many animals out in the wild that, that make okay. a meal out of a horse. Okay. So horses have had to, become very aware of their surroundings. So their intelligence is not like a dog, it's different. They have a very high sense of awareness that is far beyond a lot of animals. Their eyes are wide set on the sides of their head. That means they could see pretty much even behind their bodies. Their capability of feeling something before it's even near them is very high. So their ability to read a person is very great. Okay. And that is why, that is why a horse can bond with you very, very strongly, but it can also be repelled by you very strongly. If you're a mean person or if you're having a bad day or you're in a bad mood, don't go near a horse. Mm. He will not want to be near you. He'll move away. He'll back away. He might even get a little bit angry towards okay. you. So okay. that's, that's the reason. And the other thing with women, because women and horses there's a real bond and it's because women are vulnerable and so are horses. Mm -hmm. 
So women are bonding with horses in a different way because of the fact that they share some very uh, similar traits. Women are vulnerable. Uh, a lot of times we've had to run, <laughs> you know, for our lives, uh, you know, where I'm not saying that men are bad, but a lot of times we've had to be, you know. Kind of like, women are the prey. In the, we are. We, yes. In the yes. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and the other part also is, John, that there's something that is um, something that's indescribable, and that means that it goes way beyond the functioning level of our brains. There, there is an energy bond between people and horses that you really cannot articulate, but it's definitely there. Okay, an energy bond. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I'm assuming that you, you hold retreats and things like that to to take women out with horses with you or is it something that you're practicing just on your own right now well yeah the retreats that i do right now are basically just for women to come to learn the practices that i do so um i have something called the goddess blueprint and okay. it is a certain amount of steps it's 10 steps that women go through and they learn how to become powerful again the horses that has to be one-on-one -on -one. Um, or with a group, but they've got to be able to come to my place. So a lot of times I will work with women virtually around the world. I have people in lots of different locations and we can bond and connect one-on-one -on -one through my membership site. But okay. in order to work with the horse, that's got to be in person. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us more about the goddess blueprint and what that is? Yeah, well, the Goddess Blueprint is something that I put together because of my own steps that I know that I had to take when I was going through all this stuff. And so I started to take note of what I was doing that was really helping me to get better and to get stronger. Okay. So I made sure that I put all these things down. And it took me a while. It took me a couple of years, actually, to really um, get this to where I know that it is a true system and it really, really works. And it just starts off with the very first thing which is make a decision now to stop accepting less than you deserve. And this is for pretty much everybody. It doesn't just have to be women, but women especially because a lot of times we have devoted our lives to others, family and husbands and children and everything else. And we have put ourselves last. And that's why we're waking up saying, what am I doing? You know, I'm lost. I don't feel good. So the first thing, most important, make a decision if you don't make that decision nothing else happens that's it amazing okay mm -hmm. that's really powerful yeah i think that is nothing to do with m women or men that decision that's just a beautiful decision for anybody. exactly exactly yeah and there's a couple of other things too i mean there's a lot of things that i do um but there's three things that I like to make sure that I give to a lot of the people, even before they get into my courses or anything like that. And the first thing is so important and it's clarity of thought. So nothing happens without that clarity of thought. You know, you can have something in your heart, but if it's wishy-washy or it's just kind of like you don't know which way to go, you're never going to get there. So you've got to get really clear on what it is, okay? Clarity of thought. The second thing is the quality of your actions. How are you going into these things that you want to do? What's the quality that you're using? If you go into something with bad intentions or the quality of what you're doing isn't good, you know you're going to be a failure. You know it's not going to work. So you've got to have quality in the actions of what you're doing. Okay, that's the second thing. And then the third thing is consistency. You cannot do something just for a little while and then give up because it's not working. You know, Honestly, if you look at all the famous inventors and geniuses of the world, they all came up with the things that they did because of persistence. They all hit brick walls too. They all hit dead ends. You yeah. cannot get there without being a really into really being consistent. You've got to have consistency, you know? That's so true. I think, uh, was it uh, Edison who said, after failing like a thousand times, uh, people made fun of him. He said, no, I just found a thousand ways that don't work. <laughs> that's exactly you know, right. That's, kind of, that's yeah. kind of it, isn't it? We just find the ways that don't work. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. And don't curse it. Bless it. And say, this is another thing that I know I don't want to do. You know? So bring on something else, you know? And having the intention in your heart, the desire with emotion. It is so important. If you don't have emotion... In with that desire, it's cold. 
it's cold. You know, you gotta have the fire, fire, the fire with the desire and the emotion, and you're gonna get what you want. You're gonna get it. Nice. Yeah. Now I'm really interested in, in the very first, in all those things are really cool, but I really love the first. Well, I like all of them. Clarity of thought, uh, quality of actions. Uh, what was the third one? Consistency. Consistency. Yeah. Um, and even before that, about not accepting less than you deserve. That's right. Making can a decision. You, can you That's guide us through a way of making that decision? How would we? How would we go about making this kind of decision in a way that shakes our mind? Mm. Well, you know, this is the thing. I counsel and I coach so many women, and they stay stuck for such a long time because they never make that decision. And it's fear that stops them. So what I will say is that if you can just look at whatever it is that you want and find the fear that's in there, the fear of your success, that will allow you, if you, if you identify that fear and you know what it is, you can make that decision afterwards because you'll get rid of that fear. Now, the fear is usually a fear of loss. You know, we are human beings. We've got emotions. We have things that we go through every single day that formulate how we feel about things and our belief systems, okay? We develop these fears usually just because of the things we're going through every day, but the fear of loss is major. So you could be afraid of losing your youth or your mate or your job or your popularity, you, you know, or, or your country, you know, Hey, listen, the reason why wars are fought is because of fear. It's because of one country being afraid that another country is going to come in or another faction is going to come in and take what we have. It's all fear based. If you can identify the fear and really get serious about that because you're going to have to do some soul searching. When you find that fear and you identify it and get rid of it, you can make the decision. And the decision is to grow. It's to stop accepting less than you deserve. But that only comes from the soul searching and getting rid of the fear that's stopping you. You know? Okay. Okay. That's powerful. And yeah, I'm just wondering, I'm just making this, the decision for myself to, to do that. And uh, okay, so everyone, everyone who's listening, I'm sure that there's tons of women who are listening who want to find out more about you. How can they find you out and how can they uh, join your groups or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so you can go on to GiselleToner.com. That's my website. And on GiselleToner.com, there are lots of ways where you can connect with me. One of the ways is you can actually get a free ebook that I put together that's um, it's really good. It's called the quick quote workbook for power and purpose. And what it does is it gives you um, many, many quotes. Okay. Every day you'll get a new quote. What you do is you'll read the quote and you'll allow it to stir something in your mind or in your heart that's going to motivate you. And you write down the action step of, of what you're going to do as a result of reading that quote and how it's going to Put you into another direction to go into something where you're going to take an action so that is free so if you go onto my website get the workbook and then i'll be able to connect with you and then i can give you more information about all the other stuff that you want okay cool yes oh well, and also and also if you really want to get into yoga go to my website for yoga which is gigantic i put it together myself over a period of many years and it's called eternityyoga.com okay eternityyoga.com well, if I uh, wasn't such a, a manly man, I would go and join your groups. I'm not. You can please come oh. and join my group. Please. <laughs> I would love to have you. We really need a male perspective. No, I would. I would join for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll become the god. Right? Yes. So, Honestly, we do need. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about that. I swear. <laughs> we, need, we need men like you. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank we you. do. The world it's needs actually, men like you. Yeah, it takes a little bit more courage to like to to be less insecure. I think insecurity is the thing that causes the the macho ness. Yeah, you know, being super macho is just a um, a, a a prideful kind of cover up for yeah. the insecurity that is underneath. So, being 
it's like the same. Like when you can get, when you can start to address the insecurity and, and accept your vulnerability, basically, then you can just feel more, more courageous. I've, I've become a lot more courageous by looking at and accepting the various parts of myself. Yeah. Uh, because I don't feel like there's a little weak thing that I'm trying to protect. It's not really there. There's no weakness there. But um, if I'm not checking, I'm afraid to look, then I just let it linger. You know, I let it stay. Right. So I have done a lot of kind of work like that. And as a result, I'm less macho and kind of fake than maybe some other people. But uh, it's a good example. It's just hard for some men to see it as a positive yeah. thing. But yeah. See, that's what we need, John. That's what we need. We really do. And, you know, you just hit it right on the head. You are absolutely so on point with that one. Because there are so many men that are really, they're coming from a place of fear, believe it or not. They may look, they may look like they're strong and macho. Meanwhile, they got so many insecurities inside of them. And it translates into anger and aggressiveness and, you know, mistreating women and, and lots yeah. of other things, oh, yeah. right? Oh, for sure. Yes. It's yeah. very much the same. It's, it's the, yeah, that's, that's the reason people lash out at women or attack weak people, like all the bullying stuff is, they yeah. feel, they're feeling really weak inside. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we need guys like you. Okay, well, I'll join your program if I can, or let's, uh, let's talk about it. Yay! And, uh, I will if I can, and uh, yeah. Yay! Okay, so I think we're getting close to the end of this interview, but um, thank you so much. And I really hope everyone follows up with you and uh, takes your yoga classes and gets your uh, your quote, quick quote worksheet for mm -hmm. power. For power and purpose. Power and purpose. Yes. yes. Alrighty then. Well, uh, thank you so much. And is there any last words you have before we go? No, I just want to say thank you so much, John, because it's really nice for me to be on the other end for a change because I'm usually the one doing the interviewing. So it's good to be in the hot seat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You are welcome. All right. All right. Well, see you later. And bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And check us out again next time. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.